Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington and today I'm on the hunt for one particular plant that I think you'll find really fascinating because it's a parasitic plant. Now parasitic plants aren't too rare in nature. They can be found in a wide variety of ecosystems around the world, but this particular parasitic plant is different for a couple of reasons. Because of the way that it looks, because of the way that it acts, and because of its reputation. It's not thought too highly of, especially by our very own USDA. So which particular parasitic plant am I talking about? Well, come on, take a walk with me, we'll see if we can find it. Okay, so I found the plant. I'm really excited. So I'm in a wet meadow type habitat here in western Pennsylvania. It's late August. I had a feeling I'd find this plant right around here. So this plant has a couple different common and wonderful names including devil's guts, strangleweed, wizard's net, love vine, and it's most commonly known as dodder. D-O-D-D-E-R. Now dodder belongs to a large family of plants known as the Convolvulaceae family. And you're probably familiar with that family if you're familiar with morning glory, if you're familiar with bindweed, even sweet potato, Ipomia batatas, they're all in that Convolvulaceae family. Now, daughter belongs to a rather large genus of plants known as the Cuscuta genus. There's about 200 species of daughter worldwide. All of these are stem parasites on other plants. So soon after germinating from seed, Cuscuta or daughter plants wrap around a host they penetrate their host plant via these little tooth-like structures and they suck out water, they suck out nutrients, they suck out carbohydrates from their host. Now where I live in Pennsylvania, there are eight species or so of daughter plants. Most of them are actually rare, but this one that I'm seeing all around here twining around these native plants, this is our most common species, which is Cuscuta granovii. Now this plant is easily identified, at least to the daughter genus, the Cuscuta genus, because it has these yellow-orangish strands, very thin, almost like silly string or spaghetti, that wrap around other plants. And not too many plants in nature look like this. Now the common name daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R, probably comes from an old German word, dotter, D-O-T-T-E-R, which refers to the yolk of an egg. And so the color is very similar to the yolk of an egg. And now I can see this plant in flower, it's got these little white flowers and I can also see the fruits as well. So we see the flowers, we also see the fruits. Now I'm seeing a couple different hosts for this daughter plant. This is a plant right here known as Persicaria sagittata, which is tear thumb. It's in the knotweed family or the buckwheat family. This thing will rip your hands apart if you go up and down really quickly because these stems and these leaves have recurved prickles that are very sharp. So that's what I call tear thumb. But I guess you could also call this tear pinky or tear middle finger or tear anything else on your body because it's that sharp. So you definitely don't want to do this on a tear thumb plant. But the Cuscuta is penetrating this plant right here and sucking out some of these nutrients. There's a white snake root plant back here, Ageratina altissima. This one is being used as a host as well. Now as I mentioned earlier, Cuscuta is not thought too highly of by our very own USDA and other governmental institutions. It's actually put on the USDA's federal noxious weeds list because it's considered to be an agricultural pest because it tends to get into fields with clover and alfalfa and soybeans and beets and carrots and asparagus and some ornamentals. It's very difficult to treat because if you're treating Cuscuta, we are also treating the host plant. And so you really need mechanical methods in order to remove daughter. And that can take a lot of time and a lot of investment, a lot of money as well. So a lot of people don't like this plant, but what's interesting is that in the wild, it's actually not that bad. It doesn't really kill these host plants. It does penetrate them, it does suck out their nutrients, it doesn't sound too good, but it actually might be doing some good things for the host plant. We're going to get to that in a few seconds. So I actually wanna go over the life cycle of daughter because it's really fascinating. And even if you know a little bit about daughter, there's probably a couple things you didn't know about its life cycle and ecology. So here's another daughter plant penetrating this wild blackberry. So we've already seen two other hosts. Now this is the third host that I'm seeing and I wouldn't be surprised if there are more hosts around here. So you can see this silly string-like plant kind of looks like spaghetti wrapping around this blackberry. So how does this plant start out? Well, like many other plants, it starts out with a seed that will germinate at the ground level. Now what's interesting about the early plants is that they don't contain any cotyledons. This plant doesn't contain any true roots. 
Now it has a root-like structure, which kind of functions like a root, but it only lasts a couple of days before it withers away. So what's interesting about the early plants, the seedlings of Cuscuta or Dodder, they can only last a couple of days, maybe five days, maybe seven days, and only grow about four inches before they die. So they have to find a host. So how does Dodder choose which plant to hook up to? Well, it essentially does this by sniffing out the appropriate partner, the appropriate host. And more specifically, what it's doing is it's attracted to these plant volatiles, these airborne chemical cues that plants in nature are secreting. So Dodder is attracted to certain plants and it hooks up with them, it touches them, and initial contact with these plants induces the Dodder plant to create what's known as prehistorial cells. And what these cells do is they secrete adhesion substances like pectin and polysaccharides, which support adhesion of daughter to the host plant. Not only that, these prehistorial cells secreted by daughter also induce the host plant, so this blackberry plant for instance, to secrete their own sticky substances to support adhesion of daughter to the host plant. After attachment, next comes the penetration phase. So these prehistorial cells develop into something known as hostoria. And these hostoria are peg-like structures or tooth-like structures that are actually injected into the host plant. And what's so crazy is that you can see them with your naked eye. If you look really closely at the host stems, right where daughters attach to the host stem, you'll see these little peg-like structures that are inserted into the host plant. Now the cells at the tip of the hostoria form what are known as searching hyphae that seek out the vascular tissue within the host plant, the xylem and the phloem cells. And once contact is made with those cells, the daughter is now able to absorb, then extract and suck out water and nutrients and polysaccharides. And daughter is thus provided with sustenance. Now daughter is successful for a wide variety of reasons. There's a lot of things that give it its edge in the wild. And one of those things is that daughter is able to hook up with mycorrhizal fungi. So it has mycorrhizal partners in nature. And so whenever daughter germinates into that little root-like structure in a little stem, even though it's not a true root, that root-like structure is still able to form mycorrhizal connections, specifically with mycorrhizal fungi known as arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And it's been shown that daughter that's hooked up to mycorrhizal fungi can grow three to four times faster than daughter that's not hooked up to mycorrhizal fungi. And remember when I said that daughter doesn't last too long before finding a host. It has to find a host within a couple days, four, five, six, seven days before it dies. Well, the daughter that's hooked up to a mycorrhizal partner can last a lot longer without finding a host compared to the daughter that's not hooked up to our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. So fungi is one thing that gives it its edge in the wild. Another thing that daughter has going for it in the wild is that it's able to insert its own phytochemistry and its own molecules into the host plant. So we already talked about daughter extracting things from the host, but it can also insert things. For example, Daughter inserts RNA molecules known as microRNA molecules into the host plant and these microRNA molecules target specific RNA molecules in the host known as messenger RNAs that code for proteins essential for host defense. So with the host defense impaired, daughter is able to increase its growth. Another extremely fascinating thing about daughter and something that does really give it its edge is that even though it is a parasite, it's still able to photosynthesize to an extremely small degree. So most Cuscuta species studied do contain small and varying amounts of chlorophyll. And so it's able to carry out photosynthesis to a small degree in the seedling stage before it hits the host. And also while it is twining around the host, Cuscuta species are still able to photosynthesize to a very, very, very small degree. And because Cuscuta species demonstrate a wide variety of photosynthetic capabilities, Researchers theorize that there's some evolutionary reduction in the ecological role of daughter from a hemiparasite to a hollow parasite. So what the heck do those words mean? Well, hemiparasite is essentially something that does contain chlorophyll and it's able to photosynthesize, but it also parasitizes the host for its nutrients. Hollow parasite, hollow from hollos, the Greek word meaning whole, so it's a whole parasite, is fully parasitic and it's not able to photosynthesize. Now all this talk about daughter so far has been kind of one-sided and I realize that it's probably my fault because that's the way I've been portraying it. We might think what a manipulative, sneaky little plant this thing is. Like wrapping itself around a host, inserting tooth-like structures into the host and sucking nutrients out. What good things might this be doing at all in the wild? Well, I alluded to this a little earlier and I said this thing might actually be doing some good things for some of these host plants. 
and specifically what it might be doing is acting as an above ground mycorrhizal network. And it's not a mycorrhizal network because this thing is clearly not a fungus, it's a plant, but it can act like a mycorrhizal network. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about mycorrhizae in nature and you think about, for example, a tree that's hooked up to a mycorrhizal fungus, well that tree can essentially communicate to another tree over here by way of this mycorrhizal network. For example, if an oak tree is being predated upon by insects, it can ramp up its phytochemistry and signal to another tree that's hooked up to the mycorrhizal network that insects are in the area, predators are in the area, this other tree will get the message and ramp up its phytochemistry and protect itself before it becomes predated upon. Well, when we look at daughter, I'm looking at it right now and I can see that various plants are hooked up to this daughter plant right here. This daughter is hooked up to tear thumb, for example, right over here. This daughter plant might also be hooked up to this plant right here. These plants can communicate with one another. And research has shown that, for example, a tear thumb plant right here that might be predated upon by insects, and it's hooked up to the daughter plant. It'll ramp up its phytochemistry to protect itself against further predation, but it'll also signal to another plant via this daughter network that there are insects in the area, hey, ramp up your phytochemistry too. So this white snake root plant can potentially also ramp up its phytochemistry to protect itself from predation by insects before it becomes predated upon. So it kind of acts in a similar way to a mycorrhizal network. It's incredibly fascinating stuff. And this is borne out in the research. And the benefits of daughter, if you want to call them benefits, don't just stop in the wild. They can also translate over to the domesticated realm, specifically they're used by human beings over the past couple of centuries, if not millennia. We see that, for example, Aztecs used certain species of daughter to produce a beautiful yellow dye. Native American cultures, specifically those in the Southwest, gathered seeds of certain daughter species and incorporated them into soups and stews. Daughter species have been used as ingredients in Chinese herbal mixtures, specifically those to restore ovarian function in women. One species of daughter has been tested for its anti-diabetic properties. Because of its ability to inhibit an enzyme in our bodies, and that enzyme is known as alpha-glucosidase, so the daughter species has potential anti-alpha-glucosidase abilities. And also, certain daughter species have been used and tested in the prevention of hair loss and treatment of hair loss, specifically hair loss caused by chemotherapy. So, wild silly string, wild spaghetti, love vine, strangleweed, devil's guts, wizard net, also, daughter, which is what most people call it, regardless of what you call it, I encourage you to get out there and look for it, specifically if you've never seen it before. I mean, there are 200 species worldwide, so there's a good chance wherever you live, there's a daughter species that you can learn. If you've seen this one a million times before, maybe go out and observe it in a completely different perspective, in a new light, because I'm sure you learned a couple different things about this plant. Look for those hostoria, those little peg-like structures, and maybe try to appreciate some of the good things that it might be doing for the ecology of the land where you live. So thank you so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it. As always, if you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, feel free to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You can also head on over to learnyourland.com and sign up for the email newsletter so that we can stay in touch. You can also follow Learn Your Land on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks again for watching this video. I appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one.